you okay Perfect. to record for us, Sarah? There we go. Lovely. Over to yourself, Stephen. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ian and Sarah. Um, so today, what I would like to talk to you about is asset location. Um, so a bit about myself. My name is Stephen Brooks. I'm a senior engineer in the geotech department in buildings and civils in the technical authority. Um, I'm a member of the Chartered Institute of Civil Engineering Surveyors. Um, and hopefully this presentation will, um, uh, I suppose it's a bit of a tongue in cheek look at how uh, we look at assets and we manage the location of assets within network rail. And um, there's a few slides which are a bit, as I say, tongue in cheek, and there are some that um, make, hopefully will make us think, um, you know, maybe we really need to have a look and, and do something here. So, um, fundamentally, um, we have some databases in Network Rail, and um, here we've got some particular uh, data silos, and they belong to independent assets. And these assets are quite typical, and I'll, I'll pick on uh, assets that are familiar to me very, very closely, such as geotech, earthworks, drainage, structures. Um, whilst we all sit under the buildings and civils uh, branch, we technically, are, we're, we're all independent silos of data. We've got independent systems holding up our information. However, we are all interconnected. So there's lots of things that relate from an earthworks perspective to a drainage perspective, to a structures perspective. So they're all completely interconnected and you can expand that across multiple assets within within network rail. Uh, and one of the biggest things that sort of connects everything um, really is that everything happens somewhere and at some point in time. And that's fundamentally true. There's a, there's a knock on effect of um, uh, whether event happens may overflow some drainage which then has a knock-on effect to either a structure or an earthwork or another asset so they're all interrelated and if you knew the time and the precise location of where that occurred you can start to look at all of our assets as a system and the knock-on effect that one thing has to another and that's somewhere that we would ideally like to get to um it's it's aspirational i think at the moment it's it's something we definitely um, want to do. So one of the biggest things I've come across, certainly in Network Round and, and, and probably in other organisations as well, is, is there's a, what I consider to be quite a vast um, difference between the expectation of what we're, uh, what we're sold and versus the rea reality of what we actually get. So um, in, in terms of geospatial, um, Data. We're often sold, you know, this highly, highly modern, interconnected um, device or system where everything's connected. It's all connected to the Internet of Things. One sensor is connected to another sensor, and it works as an entire system. Unfortunately, when we often talk with uh, organisations or suppliers, and, and we say, "Look, oh, that's a great idea." We'd love to use that technology on our railway. We then go out and we provide them with our data. And unfortunately, our data, to be fair, I think is quite antiquated. Um, and, you know, it's, we're using a system that has been around for, well, pre-satellite location days. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't quite work as the, the, the suppliers potentially anticipate our data to work so what happens is when they go away and they come back with the solution what we often get is essentially our original data with lots of bells and whistles on it but not necessarily what we actually asked for and um it's really quite um concerning i've seen this multiple times on multiple different projects that the the, the vision that we originally sold is is never realized completely and we're always provided with a this is almost as good as you can get style thing so um part of the reason i think is 
is how we actually describe our asset locations exactly. So our asset locations, um, we, we can describe them with a local name, for example. And if we type that into a, a database without proper controls, we can type in um, lots of different things. Um, I've got dyslexic children and, and they, their, their spelling isn't very good and, and, and I completely appreciate other people um, can't, all, you know, mis, mistype things when they're entering data. Without the right controls, you know, you can't, you can't uh, validate that. Now, a human would probably read a lot of those and realise that actually you're probably referring to the same location, but a computer would get confused. Um, so another way that we can look at data is, is just looking at mileages. Um, and, you know, you can describe a single mileage in multiple different ways. Now, again, a human would read that and understand, looking at all the way through those, that those locations are all very similar. Some of them in chains, some of them in miles and yards, uh, some of them in miles and chains. It's, you know, some of them are, are almost decimal as well. So you, you start to look at things in a slightly different way. You could start using ordnance survey grid references, but again, in the same way, without the right controls, there are multiple different ways that I've seen data entered into lots of our databases with um, ordnance survey grid references. And uh, without the right controls, you know, how, which one's right? Some of them use letter codes in uh, replacement for numbers. Um, I mean, all of these locations are technically in the same place, but they're all slightly different in some form or another. Um, we could look to using latitude and longitude. I mean, we all have mobile phones. They all use GNSS um, signals and they all record latitude and longitude. But again, there are a multitude of ways of recording latitude and longitude. And the number of decimal places is really key here because the decimal places do actually define your precision that you're looking at. So I've seen a number of databases where we've got, as per the bottom value there, we've got um, I think that's uh, 12 decimal places, 10, 12 decimal places. Um, and, you know, if you were to use that as a position, you would need to have a scientific microscope to find it because that's one micron. It's so precise that it, it's it's almost meaningless. So we need to actually start to help a lot of this data capture and define what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable in terms of how you know how should we be advising people to capture this data? You know, we people often hear go and get better data, go and get more accurate data, but what is the appropriate um, data to use? So my suggested recommendations are um, uh, for latitude and longitude, you don't need more than five decimal places to get to you to an accuracy of a meter. Uh, with the Ordnance Survey Grid, I recommend uh, six digit references with an easting and northing, ideally separated into two separate attribute columns. And again, same with the latitude and longitude, two separate attribute uh, columns. And with the mileages, um, I've made, I've highlighted one there, but actually the first one in that list is also an equally valid uh, um, mileage reference as well. You can have just a drop the zero at the beginning of the 52, but it's really important when you're looking at yardage to have uh, four digits there because you might see 0 0.132 and is that supposed to be 1,320 or is that just 132 yards? So you just have to make that really clear in databases. So let's have a look at what happens when we have a particular asset that uses both mileages, Ordnance Survey Grid and Latin Longitude, all stored in the same system. So um, here we have Network Rail's uh, regional boundaries, um, and we can plot this database using ELR mileages. Now, when we plot by ELR mileages, obviously everything has to fall onto the railway because fundamentally 
you know, you can't have, you know, there's no real iron mileage that's not next to a bit of railway. So what you see here is everything that had a valid ELR and mileage. What you don't see is all of the data that didn't have a valid ELR and mileage. So you get that, that information is lost. So we could look at exactly the same data in, and, and this is, I will add a safety critical database, but uh, this database was a cut from uh, September um, last year. Um, we can look at the Eastern and Northern Valley now, when you look at the Eastern and Northern Valley, so what you've got, the red dots essentially show you where the, um, the same values and the purple lines join up those red dots with their equivalent ELR and mileage location. Now, if you were to see that, you could clearly see that obviously the locations um, that are in the sea or overseas are entirely false and you wouldn't have much confidence in them. But there are also more subtle ones that are um, where you've got differences inside the same regional boundary. And the subtle difference may be a few hundred metres. Now, it's really difficult to know whether your eastern and northern is correct or whether your ELR and mileage is correct, especially if both locations are adjacent to the railway. Um, this particular database also had latitude and longitude um, stored within there. So when we look at latitude and longitude, um, what happens is uh, we get some of the data plots in the UK, data plots just off the coast of Somalia. Now, the reason for that is simply because that when that data was entered, it's been entered as longitude and latitude. So what's really not obvious um, to everybody is Eastings and Northings are quite a common um, reference within the UK. Ordnance Survey maps have been around for a long time. Um, latitude and longitude, um, when it's easier to say latitude and longitude, but actually it's the equivalent of saying northing and easting, not easting and northing. So what's happened is simply somebody has entered the longitude value into the latitude column and vice versa. And what you end up with is almost like an inverse version of the UK, um, just off the coast of Somalia. Thankfully, um, we have a geospatial policy in place. Uh, that particular policy was created uh, or issued in December 2020. Unfortunately, probably not the best time to land a standard just uh, during a pandemic um, and it has a compliance date of March 2024. So in that standard, it states that the use of ELR and mileage is no longer accurate enough to geospatially locate assets on the company's infrastructure and that we must um, master everything to plus or minus one meter in the horizontal, so eastings and northings, not vertical, so uh, two meters vertically, one meter horizontally of their true location. So that's not just assets that fall within the track, but all of our assets, line side assets as well, um, all of our earthworks, drainage, vegetation, boundaries, etc., need to be accurately mapped to within one meter. Now, part of the problem is that we send people out with mobile phones. Now, any of you that have used a mobile phone will know that the accuracy of the location given the street isn't great. And um, so that accuracy could be plus or minus 10, 20 meters, maybe more, depending on the location you are. So if you're in a deep cutting, you're unlikely to get a very good accuracy location. If you're in a dense woodland, so you'll get a lower accuracy. If you're in between lots of buildings, uh, you know, you might be uh, an art, sort of an artificial cutting, you know, you might have a railway line going between lots of tall buildings and you're low down. Effectively, you know, the signal bounces around those um, objects and you can't get a decent um, location. So we need to look at that. We need to have a look at how do we equip our staff to actually meet this particular standard. Um, it's very clear from um, observational uh, 
uh, well, from observations from colleagues in associated teams, that although people are aspiring to this particular standard, they're not going to reach it by March 2024. Um, it will be achievable, but it will take longer. Um, supplementing uh, that particular standard, we would like to see, or it would be ideal to see, a, uh, a full specification, a full standard for the network model, for off-track locations, and a linked in network model, but just distinctly separate, is the linear referencing. We would like to see a uh, standard on how we use linear referencing in the railway. Now, fortunately, um, we are in the process of uh, creating a linear referencing standard. Um, first meeting is one or two weeks away, um, and we've got a core team of people to look at how do we define how the business uses linear referencing, because despite the fact that everybody uses it and has done for many years there is no standard to definitively state how linear referencing should operate and how uh, what units we measure in and how it works so we're looking to rectify that so by talking of mileages we have a bit of a love-hate relationship with mileages and um, some of the things to really love about mileage is, is that they're sequential. So when you walk onto a track at a particular access point, you know, it, it's logical. If you walk on, let's say, 37 miles, um, you know which way is up and which way is down. You know that one way is going to be 38 miles and the other way is going to be 36 miles. So it's 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 very easy for a human to interpret your, your location because you know everything is sequential. Um, it's commonly understood within the railway industry lots of assets um i did challenge this lots of assets use it there was what i believe there's one asset that doesn't uh use it purely because they're so far away from the track um that they don't use uh elr mileage um they use postcodes because of the, the particular asset they have um and also it's the way we've always done it and i must say you've always done it it harks back to sort of the 1980s when elrs and mileages were sort of standardized across the um the business so there were uses of elrs in some parts of uh, the railway before then but it wasn't until the sort of 1980s that it was actually standardized across the entire uh uk and duplications of elr codes were removed and etc etc so um obviously if you've got a love side of this there's going to be a hate side of it um so getting the balanced approach. One of the biggest things is it's the way we've always done it. That's not necessarily a reason to keep it. Um, things that are hopefully um, I'll, I'll explain shortly is, is the baseline that we're at or the reference that we're that is used for linear referencing is not static. Um, linear referencing is very rarely used outside of the railway industry. So um, you know talking with um, emergency services, for example, uh, they often require us to use things like what three words or coordinates or these things and all things to define a location. They won't know, uh, they won't understand the nuances of the, the mileages. Um, it's not ideal for track-based assets, and I'll try and explain that again a bit more in a minute, especially on a curve. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to uh, validate your data um, just using you know, ELR and a, a mileage. And hopefully I'll explain why and how your data can potentially move uh, over a period of time or appear to move over a period of time without you changing any of your data. So mileages, how do we actually locate assets by mileages? So in order to locate somewhere, we use, we use a process called linear referencing. So linear referencing um, takes an ELR. So we're all familiar with ELRs, uh, you know, three or three letters and potentially one number code to indicate a railway corridor. Um, that gets converted to a measure line. Uh, it'll have a zero and it will have 
uh, a high mileage, a low mileage and a high mileage. So that measure line um, needs way marks. So a way mark is a digital representation or a virtual representation of the mileposts that are physically out on the track. Um, now, the mileposts that are out on the track should be every 440 yards for your quarter miles, um, but they rarely are. So what we often find is they may be 430 yards apart, they may be 460, um, they do vary, they're not precise, they never were measured to that level of accuracy. Um, maybe at that particular quarter mile, precise quarter mile, there may be an asset in the way that prevents you from putting the mile post there. So uh, they may have shifted the mile post or put it before um, a, a structure, say for example. Um, so we, what we do, is we try and convert our measure line into a calibrated measure line. So what we do is we look at those virtual way marks and we say, right, okay, we'll measure the distance so those way marks are in the position, the spatial position that they are, that the mileposts are on the ground, but they might not be 440 yards apart. So what we'll do is we'll take a ruler to those in the in the virtual world, and we'll basically measure it in, as a percentage. And we'll say, right, that distance, we are going to force to be 440 yards. So we'll call it a percentage. So 50% of that is going to be 220 yards. So it doesn't matter whether in the real world, that distance is 460 or 420, it's still, the computer still says, right, I'm 440. So it all works off of percentages based on those sort of fixed way mark locations. So when we, the final part of locating assets is, is the events. So events in this instance, we've got some trees. Here. So these trees, um, you know, they're all, they're there, we've got some, trees located uh, and somebody goes out and registers a tree and says all oh, right okay I've got a tree at 400 yards now that tree is showing early signs of stress I'm not going it, it doesn't warrant me chopping it down but it does warrant me flagging it in my data so I've logged it into my data at 400 yards now let's say two or three years have passed and um, there, there may or may not have been changes to the underlying network model. And we may have actually found that that 440 yard uh, mile post is actually in the wrong place. So the team that managed the um, network model will adjust their way marks accordingly and say, actually, okay, our way marks move, therefore our calibration moves. So when as an asset owner you go out and say right i need to, i need to instruct somebody to go out that tree it, the wall showing signs of stress really does need to, to come down can you go take down that tree at 400 yards so what they actually end up doing is when they go out there, they chop down the wrong tree potentially because they go to 400 yards and they chop down the tree at 400 yards as it um expected and they don't add Actually necessarily see the tree that they should have chopped down um, in the previous location. This is this does happen. It happens more often than we think, and certainly from an earthworks perspective, we um, often require D veg strips to be um, taken down at um, intervals along an earthwork so that we can uh, inspect the earthwork in more detail. And we we've had instances where. Uh, we've sent out instructions to go and de-veg a particular stretch of land. The examiner goes back out to have a look at their earthwork and says, well, you haven't de-vegged. And there's this big debate saying, well, we have de-vegged and we've de-vegged over here because this is where the network model says, not where you originally stated the data to be. So th this unfortunately does happen in the real world. So it, it, it's something that we really do need to, to look at in, in more detail and uh, move away from the sort of limitations of having an ELR and mileage model. So hopefully that's explained a bit about mileages and how they work and, and that update for the network model can happen periodically. Uh, it did happen 
significantly uh, a few years ago with the aerial survey data and the improvements and the knowledge that we had about our assets. And uh, um, it's happening less so, but it, it still happens now um, as data gets improved. The other thing that we need to look at, and again, this is um, less so from a track perspective. So within the sort of permanent way, um, tracks have track IDs. We know whether by their codes, whether they're up fast, down fast, up slow, down slow. Um, we have that information. Now, for all of the other assets outside of that, what do you call them? They're related to something and they're related often to the closest bit of track. Um, now, there are instances on the network where you may have to the outside like outside tracks may well be both the same. Uh, so they might have downs on the outside or ups on the outside. They, they may be in bi-directional, so which way is up and which way is down. So depending on which asset you're in, and again, I'm, I'm picking very much on, on assets within the buildings and civils environment, um, you know, we may refer to information as, as up or down. Um, and we may refer to them as left or right, and depending on which asset you look at. So you, you, you could go and talk to somebody, um, meet somebody during a, uh, a site visit and say, I'll meet you on the, the and uh, they'll go, which is that left or right? And, and you're left head scratching because you only know up and down or vice versa. So it is, it's really important. I think we need to look at how do we standardize some of our nomenclature around locating assets away from the track. But let's have a look at that in, in action. So in this scenario here, we've got some bits of track. We've got low mileage on the left, high mileage on the right, um, and we've got a bit of bi-directional in the middle. So let's have a look at how that works for structures. So structures would say low mileage is you've got a left and a right from your low mileage always regardless of uh, your track IDs and um, they always work from low to high mileage. In uh, a line side world um, they look at the track code so what you might find is you start off at the low mileage on the up when you stay on the bi-directional because it doesn't know that it's changed or anything it stays on the up and when it flips over at the other end um, it suddenly becomes down. So you've now got one side of the railway that could be up, up, down, or the opposite side, down, down, up, which doesn't make a um, huge amount of sense to somebody that just turns up on site, that you know, why, why is up suddenly become down? When you look at geotech, they use a slightly different methodology and they have more consistency um, in this particular um, environment, whereas they say, right, we're going to use, we refer back to uh, NESA, the sectional appendix, and we look at which side is up and which side is down, and, and if it flips, um, we will keep, uh, if the track code flips, we'll keep with the majority, which is either up or down, depending on which side you're on. So that's in principle how, uh, how this works. Now, What's really interesting is that if you were to expand this across the entire network, it is possible to have almost any combination of up and down and left and right, depending on which asset you're referring to. So let's have a quick look at this. And, and there are scenarios on the network where this does happen. So we have low to high mileage on the left hand side. In the middle, we have low to high mileage going the opposite direction, and then it flips back to being low to high mileage in the other direction. And part of this is to do with historic links where um, in the beaching era when lines were closed, historic um, mileage directions are retained. And there may have been junctions that no longer exist on part of this uh, particular section. So let's have a look at uh, how structures would look at it. So instantly you've now got left, right, left on the top there. Or right left right on the bottom in the drainage world you have down up down 
and on the top there and in geotech we have down 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 but the middle one is something called reverse mileage not sure if anybody's come across reverse mileage before but essentially it's where the majority um have of that particular section it doesn't make sense to flip it in the data so we essentially say that instead of having down on the left of low time mileage down is now on the right due to the nature of the or the history of that particular elr so depending on which which asset you represented if you want to do a site visit and meet somebody and say i'll oh, meet me on the up you might end up on one side of the track they might up and end up on the other side of the track it, it it's really uh it's really quite um taxing we need to we need to standardize that nomenclature uh, it does mean that some of the systems may may well have to change but um i think hopefully what i tried to illustrate here suggests that it it there's limited logic here in terms of keeping what we've got at the moment um finally i've been a bit of a rush through on, on this but finally um what we need to consider is is whether the data that we are using is fit for purpose so there are lots of things that are possible now that weren't possible uh when some of these data sets were conceived so I'll try and explain that a bit more. So here we've got some imagery from our aerial survey, which was captured in 2014 and again in sort of 2018-19. And, and here you can see we've got some track with um, a third rail or fourth rail. Apologies, I don't know the difference between the two, but it's ground-based on the outside line, outside here. Um, so what you can see here is you can visibly see where the rail heads are uh, in the middle. When we load our network model um, as these red lines, you can see that actually the red line is fitting on top of one of the rail heads on the, this, the left hand side. They should be in the middle of those tracks. Now, is the network model incorrect? Now, technically, when we look at it at this resolution, yes, it is. However, when the network model was first conceived, it was never expected to be used in this way. And I think that's really important to, to note that the network model has been fit for purpose for a long time. We are now scrutinizing it with a much greater level of accuracy because we've got things like the aerial survey data, because we can see things with LIDAR data, because we've got technology out there that says we can locate you to within a centimeter. We are now saying, that the network model is not good enough. Well, it, it was good enough and it is good enough for doing train planning. And that was its original intention. But when we start to try and use it with modern technology, it isn't fit for purpose. So let's take an example of, let's say we want to buffer the network model and we want to say, right, we want to constrain people to a distance of a particular running line. So if we did that in this scenario, um, what you might find here, and this is all hypothetical, what you might find here is the, the track on the left hand side of the screen. You can only just about get to the running rail um, on the right hand side. Whereas if you use the um, track on the right hand side, because the buffer is so far shifted over, you could actually allow somebody to walk closer to the adjacent line than they probably should be. So it's, it's a really interesting concept here. And when we have to remember that network model was never intended to be used in this way. So there are other data sets out there that we can use to help us. And one of those is our um, uh, railhead data that was part of the feature extraction information in 2014. Now, Unfortunately, due to controls, um, financial controls and limitations and things, that data was never fully integrated into our system, but the capability is there. And we do need to make sure that we maintain a lot of our data so that you know, whilst we try and exploit 
new technology, we must continue that improvement of all, and long-term maintenance of all of our data to make sure it remains fit for purpose. And that was my last slide. So thank you very much for listening and happy to take questions. Lovely. So if people wanted to put hands up, that'd be great. Um, or there's a few questions in the chat, but uh, oh, sorry, I'm not sure. Got a, no, it's all right, but we've got a chat, we've got a hands first, I think. If anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask, no, doesn't look like so. I, I think, yeah, yeah, a lot of the stuff's observations, isn't it? There we go, Peter Halliwell. Peter, Hi, go Peter. ahead, Peter. Hi, right, thanks for that. That was um, really interesting, Stephen. Um, in the approach that you describe, um, a lot of the drive I understand for integrating location has been through the use of BIM. Is BIM consistent with the topology of the railway and the structure of our assets? Um, so I'll, 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 I'll offer a personal opinion on BIM rather than an official opinion on BIM. So. Um, my personal view is BIM is great if you're building new assets. If you're starting from scratch, such as HS2, they are going to build an incredible BIM representation of their railway infrastructure. The trying to, I would say, drag network rail from its historic data into a BIM world is very, very difficult because um, we have so many systems that have lots of different ways of retaining that information. You have to essentially bring all of those up to the right level of accuracy together. And it's like trying to steer a tanker. It, it's, it's very, very difficult to do. It's not impossible. And the way to do it is to do it piecemeal. But we have to recognise that the aspiration for BIM is a long-term objective. It's not something we're going to achieve in the next sort of few years, I would say, much longer term. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks, Pierre. Anybody else got any questions? Or uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, yeah, I was going to say how to say that. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Stephen. Um, yeah, so I'm really interested. I don't want to um, sort of preempt, but this suite of standards that you're on policies that you're thinking of bringing out, how would you how would you like them to be? Because this this makes a lot of sense to me, <laughs> and um, and the work that we've done with uh, RGDS, the national gauging data, and lining that up, and taking challenges from INAM and then sort of geospatial location and and, and sort of integrating that. Um, you know, what, what's your vision for where is it going to end up with those sort of different policies? Um, well, I think, first of all, I think they're long overdue. <laughs> um, so it would be good to have certainly at least one of those out later on this year. That's the vision to get one out uh, as soon as possible, We're followed up by one of the others uh, soon after. Um, that is out of my control at the moment. We've got a new head of asset data, Chris Stanley, um, who is very keen to pursue with these particular standards um, because it is currently restricting us from properly adopting and integrating a lot of great new technology. Um, and I think we need to recognize that fact that actually, you know, we have great aspirations, there's great technology out there, but we shoot ourselves in the foot by having data that is not fit for purpose the technology of that accuracy and we and we need to we need to update it and and it may have come across quite negative and i know there are lots of parts of the business that are going through and updating that data and they know that and we're getting databases now which are predominantly geospatially located assets and then moving away from these sort of text field databases um and you know you, people can mistype data i do it in my job and it, it's you know, it's an easy mistake to make, whereas if you can visualise something and you can see where it is, it's very easy to know if something is plotted 
you know, 100 metres in the wrong place? You know, is it actually on the railway or is it, have you just located it in someone's back garden, for example? You can see that very clearly. So, um, yeah, the aspiration is, is to get there and get there as quick as possible. And we need to, we need to make them cross industry wide um, and interoperable because you know, we've got to move away from that sort of railway focused look at how we process data. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Chris. Can't mute if you're trying to talk, yeah. Otherwise, we'll move on to Neil and we'll come back to Chris. Go ahead, Neil. Hi, Stephen. Um, sorry, I missed the first couple of minutes, so you may have already covered it. But um, there's a there's a whole plethora of data that's coming in at the moment. We've got the aerial surveys. We've, we're looking at potential drone surveys. We've got the Fugro train mounted monitoring systems that are all sort of pulling in data. But they're also pulling in data at different stages of projects and the things. So how is best to coordinate all of that data together? And and sometimes they're even on different snake grids and yeah. OS grids, and it, it it becomes quite difficult to tie up. And then what do you do? And I know HS2 have had this problem where you get a discrepancy between two mileages and, and you have to then, I think on HS2, they've had to sort of create a, a position in between where actually they lose some changes to actually get the two two things to work up together. So um, I would refer to some of the network rail surveying colleagues for some of the answers to that. I don't work in Snake Grid. That's a level of precision that I personally don't work in because I'm looking at sort of meter level accuracy. They're looking at sort of millimetric. So I would refer to um, Bob Dan, Missoula or Graham Hutchinson, who are two of our NR surveyors for that. They work a lot with Snake Grid. Um, with regards to the aerial survey, drone survey, RILA, um, we really need to um, resolve this issue of capturing data once and sharing it multiple times, having a proper data repository that is, um, you know, there are so many controls that are used for capturing LIDAR data um, from the helicopter. We've got LIDAR being captured from airplanes. We've got LIDAR being captured from train mounted devices. They go, they have a lot of controls. You can do it with a drone, but um, the drone requires um, just as much um, constraints and controls to get that as accurate as the other devices. At the moment, I don't see that happening very often unless we go to external suppliers to capture all of that to that level of standard because it is time consuming, you need ground control points, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, we should be bringing all those things together and we should be disseminating them to everybody because what you don't want to do is go out and survey something and you find out, you know, two months ago, somebody else has been out there with a drone and done what you've just done. And, you know, we're not using the technology to the, the, the best that we should do. And we do have a survey data portal or platform, um, but it doesn't have everything in there at the moment. And we need to get that working properly. We need to get train mounted data in there. We need to get aerial survey data in there, drone data, um, so that we have a one stop repository. Thank you. Brilliant. Should we try and bring Chris back again one more time? No, still can't hear you, Chris. OK, so I think that brings us to the end then, um, Stephen. So I've been lucky enough to to have this presentation for the second time now, and uh, I think you can see the volume of questions. Do we do we want to have a look um, at the questions I in the you chat? Have my, I've done it, and every time I look it through it, um, they're they're pretty much statements, I think. Unless okay. anybody's got anything different, but I think they're pretty much statements. Um, oh, sorry, this one at the end. I don't know, Justin's just sent one. Interested in your views um, on setting up NR. Yeah. Right. Um, 
Justin, I don't know if you can expand on your question any more than that. What do you mean by uh, international expert suppliers? Uh, actually, there, are, there are other suppliers that have lots of different solutions out there. Uh, I mean, um, um, Expos, there's, uh, which I think was a Russian manufacturer, which clearly you wouldn't be interested in that now, but uh, there are many other systems out there that have their own map system, they have their own location system. And I just wondered if this, it's a broad question asking, is this something that the NR should come up with its own uh, exclusive design on how you solve those problems you just described? Or should you be looking at uh, one of the systems that's already out there? And it's a, it's a very broad question. I'm interested in your view as to how you think uh, Network Rail's strategy should be. Uh I, I think our strategy should really um, look at that sort of interoperability of our data. Um, we work enormously with suppliers um, in order to develop their tech. Whatever we do in terms of storing our location information has to be compatible with third parties and it has to go uh, both, both ways. So information that we consume, we have to be able to integrate it into our systems and vice versa. We've got to look at it beyond just railway. Um, however, there are some particular nuances that are bespoke to the railway, and we need to ensure that we don't lose some of the great benefits. So remember with the mileage, we've got that, that sort of the love and hate side of it. Now, there's some really great and powerful information that can be, um, certainly when you turn up on site, if you know that you can your location you know one direction is sequentially higher or lower that's really powerful as somebody um in a particular location at a particular time however from a holistic systems perspective it doesn't work as well so we've got to get the balance right and that's what's something that we're trying to aspire to is get the balance right between having a, a generic industry-wide location system and one that works for track workers as well because you know if you give somebody coordinates to go to and you say you today you've got to go to these coordinates and these coordinates you know it's going to be really difficult for them to plan um where they go but if we move towards a system where we plot on a map where they where the tasks are then the, that particular track worker can find a, the, the most appropriate way around it so it's a bit of a woolly answer but i think interoperability and compatibility across multiple industries is key that's where we need to get to okay thank you and I, I wouldn't rule out any particular system or whatever um other than systems of location that require some level of uh, if there's a proprietary license over that particular system. So if there is a location-based system that requires a license, it is very restrictive when you get to that interoperability stage. So we have a license for what three words. We can store all of our assets with what three word locations. However, as soon as we try and share that data, we cannot use what three words unless the supplier has their own what three words location or license so that's what we need to be very conscious of so it's not saying we don't use it i'm just saying there are restrictions but it's not as inter interoperable as just saying using latitude and longitude or these things and all things okay thank you Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Stephen. As, as I was saying, really thought provoking. And I think we do need to get a grip of this, don't we? We need to understand our data and we need to make these decisions and um, and, and take these items forward. So, yeah, sec second time I've heard it, but really, really interesting. I've taken so much more well away today than I did before. So if everybody could join me in um, thanking Stephen in the normal way. Thanks, Stephen. And we'll reaction reactions nowadays as well. Um, so thank you, Stephen. Uh, that brings me on just to the next meeting then, which is second week of March uh, 14th, that'll be, and it's a UK research and innovation scheme. So um, hopefully you can all join us on there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. Cheers all.
Thank you very much. Evening. Thank you.